Hi, Steve. Good morning, saints. Let me hear an amen. amen. Hallelujah. All right, that's the way we like to get things going. Uh, we'd like to welcome you here to Dyser United Methodist Church. This, I believe it's 22nd Sunday after Pentecost. And it's also All Saints Day. So, again, we welcome you here. And uh, let's keep Pastor Linda in our prayers as she's gone from the pulpit. And she has to turn it over to guys like me and Jim here. <laughs> she puts a lot of trust in us, and we'll do the best we can, won't we, Linda? So at this time, uh, we would ask for any announcements or uh, what's the other thing? Yeah, announcements and, and calls to service. Take it away, Steve. I just want to let everybody know, in case you have not heard, the Union Knight football team has made the Final Four. They play next Saturday at 7 o'clock in the Unidome, where it's always sunny and 72 degrees. Uh, so you don't have to worry about the weather. Um, the kids have played real hard, doing real well. Uh, just we, They need to, to see a bunch of familiar faces in the stands. And also this afternoon, the fall play, Willy Wonka, Chocolate Charlie, chocolate factory is going on this afternoon and there's several of our kids in that place so if you'd like to do need something to do this afternoon you can run over to school and watch the play John did you have something you wanted to share with the people why yes yes I did what could it be uh, it's a lot of stuff so if you got a Snickers bar you might want to start one now going to be here a while. First of all, I would like everyone here to invite you to the brunch after church today. We've got, uh, uh, let's see, it's not extrada, what is it? Egg casserole, egg hash browns, bacon and some, ham and others, <laughs> onions and peppers and some. Pat, maybe you should say what's on the menu. Yeah, I think, you know. Yeah, okay, you're Cinnamon doing rolls, job. fruit, juice, coffee. They'll be well so we invite everyone to attend. That's right after the service today. Um, see, I think that's all to say about that. Uh, today is uh, uh, our stewardship Sunday for turning in your uh, celebration of giving cards. Uh, I just want everyone to know that for your privacy, you can put your celebration of giving cards in the tray with the amounts facing down or you can fold the cards, or you can give them to Rita Callahan after the service. Uh, there are blank envelopes on the little table by the tech stand right at the back, uh, or outside her office to place them in if you want them in an envelope. Uh, Rita is the only one that's, that will see those as far as the amounts. <clears throat> um, there are cards, if you forgot to bring your cards with you, there are cards on, is it on both sides? Both sides of the pews at the ends. Pat, hold that up so stand up so everybody can see you. <laughs> those those are the cards, the giving the estimate of giving cards. If you want to fill one of those out and turn it in, um, if the cards are placed in the offering tray, Reed is going to remove those cards prior to the money counter starting to count the money this morning. So, just to ensure your privacy, or you can also mail your card into the church or place it in the offering tray next Sunday. See, that's two. Two down, one to go. Always do the good stuff first, save the bad stuff for last. Uh, I just wanted to share the state of finances for the church. Uh, first of all, I want to say a special thank you to Debbie. Debbie, you do a wonderful job. You do a wonderful job with what little we give you. <laughs> um, Thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, financial situation right now, we've, uh, to this point, I think we've paid four months of apportionments, so we're gonna have a total, by the end of the year, a total of eight additional months to pay. Uh, and with the other bills estimated for um, the next two months, the next nine Sundays, which will fill out the year, um, we need to collect in the offering plate on average, each Sunday, uh, just under $5,200. And we've been 
running somewhere in the two to three thousand dollar amount each each week. So uh, search your heart, search your wallet, <laughs> and give what you're able to give in hopes that we can meet our budget by the end of the year. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, John, for that. It's always kind of difficult to talk about money in church, but nonetheless, he did a great job of bringing it to our attention. Are there any more announcements or opportunities to serve? Let us be in the attitude of worship. We are a people gathered by a sign. That sign is the water of our baptism. It is a sign that we are God's reconciled and forgiven people. As God's reconciled and forgiven people, let us worship God. We will ask that you will stand as you are able, and we will sing the hymn for all the saints. You will find it in the Rand Hymnal, number 711, and we will sing verses 1 through 4. That was pretty good. You can applaud God if you want to. Go ahead. And now for the call to worship. Let all God's people sing praises. Let all God's people proclaim. Let all God's people offer thanks. Let all God's people worship the one who has liberated us and set us free. From generation to generation, we come to worship our loving God. Thank you. You may all be seated. And at this point in our service, on All Saints Day, we will be remembering the saints. I will be reading from the book of Revelation, chapter 7 verses 9 through 17. After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, 
standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, and around the elders, and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne, and worshipped God, singing, Amen, blessing, and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, robed in white, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of the water of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. For the word of God in the scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Amen, brother. And now we will do a reflection on All Saints Sunday. Today, All Saints Sunday, in the reading of, from Revelations, we are given a stunning view of a massive throng of people from everywhere, a multitude no one can begin to number, people from every nation, tribe, ethnicity, and language. They wave palm branches and cry out together, rejoicing in Christ's victory over sin and death, and they are all robed in white. The scene becomes more ruckus with joy as the multitude in white is joined by angels, living creatures, and other heavenly beings, all falling on their faces before the one seated on the throne and adding their own praises and blessings to that of the innumerable host. One of the elders comes over to John, no doubt dazed and amazed and overwhelmed as any of us would be on seeing this, and asks him, Who are these robed in white and where have they come from? John knows what he himself doesn't know. He trusts the elder may know, so he says, You are the one that knows. The elder does know, and he tells John, and through John, all of us. These are those coming out of the great suffering, and they have washed their robes and whitened them in the blood of the Lamb. Then the elder shifts from speaking to singing. In the Greek text, the form shifts from prose to poetry. This is why they are before God's throne, serving night and day in God's temple and the one seated on the throne dwells among them. And they do not hunger anymore. They do not thirst anymore. And the sun does not beat down on them, nor any burning heat. For the lamb is in the midst of the throne, shepherds them, and leads them to the streams of the water of life. And God wipes away every tear from their eyes. Revelation 7, 15 through 17. Or, as Charles Wesley paraphrased the final two lines, he shall all their sorrows chase, all their want at once remove, wipe the tears from every face, fill up every soul with love. What are these arrayed in white? These are the saints. These are those among whom God longs us to be. God longs for us to wear their clothes and join their victory shout. So what does it take for us to be among them, to wear their clothes? And what happens to us once we've donned their garments? The elder is quite clear. 
but we may miss just how clear the elder is. These are the ones coming out from the great suffering. Some of you might know that as the great tribulation. Revelation 7, verse 12. The first thing the elder John tells about them is they are coming out from great suffering. This means, at a minimum, that they had been in the midst of suffering. For some, no doubt, it meant great suffering happened to them and they could not escape it. But that reality wouldn't be likely to apply to every person in the innumerable throng. That means many of these people made a choice. They chose to enter into the suffering of others and with others. In other words, they followed Jesus, the one who went directly to those suffering the most and offered presence, love, hope, and healing where it was most needed. But notice something more. The tense of the participle coming out from is present. This isn't pointing to a select group of people who managed to get through a specific time of suffering in the past, nor is it a specific period of time just before the second coming of Christ adherence to that view call the Great Tribulation. No, it's pointing to an ongoing reality. It points to followers of Jesus of every generation, both entering by choice or circumstance into times of great suffering and coming out or through it. And so it points the way for even us, here and now, who may also seek to be clothed as they are, who want to be in that number when the saints go marching in. If we want to wear what saints wear, we, with them, will enter without reserve into the great sufferings of others, of those who suffer the most around us, wherever we find ourselves. These so arrayed have done more than simply enter into suffering, though. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They had identified fully with the life, blood, and the execution of Jesus. They have plunged their garments into everything he stood for in his life and everything about him that led him to a bloody death, and so have made them dazzling bright. They do not simply wear Jesus on their sleeves, as we say of those who seem to want to make a show of their religi religiosity. This is no show. This is who they are. They wear him on their entire bodies. They are his, and they let the world know it even through their clothing. They have entered into the suffering of others, not on the basis of any ideology or attempt to make the, word, make the world turn out right. They have entered into suffering of others because this is what Jesus, their Lord, has done. They have drawn near to people who are despised, persecuted, harmed, targeted, rejected, and made to suffer hunger, thirst, scorching heat, and every deprivation because they seek to follow Jesus. And this is what he did and does still through them. We can speak of what they have done Probably all of us know some saints, people who have entered into the great sufferings of others and have plunged their lives so fully into Jesus that they become clothed in him. We can name some of them now, people we know who are walking the way of Jesus among us, as well of those who are walking among us no more. It does us good to remember them this time we shall do that. Helen Halshaw.
Austin Brandt. Leland Jones. Margaret Baker. Richard Morrison. Joseph Coffey. John Goodwin. Kay Morgan. Kay Santman. William Barnes. And for all those unnamed saints. We can speak of these saints and what they did and meant to us. The elder spoke of them and how they made their robes so dazzling bright. So it is for us. We can only sing of what God has done and is doing among them and us now and forever. God has drawn every one of those whom we have known and loved and seeks to draw us all into the innermost circle of God's throne, into the holy of holies, in God's heavenly temple. God has made of the despised, the suffering, and those who stand with them priests forever. And as they are drawn around God, God dwells among them. For those who knew hunger and thirst and merciless labor under scorching heat, all of that is no more. Jesus is their shepherd, leading them evermore to pasture and life-giving streams. And in their sorrow for all the grief they have witnessed, felt, and may still feel, God wipes away every tear from their eyes. No wonder they cry. Deliverance is our God's seated upon the throne and the lambs. No wonder the heavenly beings join in the chorus. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength are God's forever and ever. Amen. How can we, this side of that hope and seeking in our own lives those same garments, not join Charles Wesley's refrain. Victory, O oh, victory, we shall gain the victory. Oh, how happy we shall be when we've gained the victory. Amen and amen. At this time, you will stand as you are able and we will sing the hymn for all the saints. It is found in the red hymnal number 711 and we'll sing verses 5 and 6.
We have two focus scriptures this morning, one from Leviticus and one from Philippians. Leviticus 19, 9 to 10. When you harvest your land's produce, you must not harvest all the way to the edge of your field, and don't gather up every remaining bit of your harvest. Leave these items for the poor and the immigrant. I am the Lord, your God. And from Philippians 4, 19, and my God will fully satisfy every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. It's been kind of fun over the summer. We've been uh, studying uh, the Old Testament. We've been looking at Exodus. We've been looking at it uh, on Sunday mornings and uh, on, on Saturday mornings. The men have been looking at Exodus as well. And it's been, to me, it's been fun to get into these old stories again. By now, most of you realize that there are the Ten Commandments appear in two places, one in um, Exodus and one in Deuteronomy, those lists are essentially the same. But there's a third place where the Ten Commandments appear, and that's here in this Leviticus. In looking at this Leviticus, I always read the part before and the part after, and in the part before, it's some rules about making sacrifices, and in the part a afterwards, it's the uh, three of the Ten Commandments, but not all of them, and they're not all on the list. And anyway, anyway Leviticus 19 is kind of a mishmash. It's uh, liturgical rules and a couple of the Ten Commandments, and they're all kind of stirred together, so we don't usually use that as a, as a place for the Ten Commandments. But the one that I, part that I want to pick up on is, it's up there. When you harvest your land's produce, you must not harvest all the way to the edge of your land, and don't gather up every remaining bit of your harvest. Leave these items for the poor and the immigrant. I am the Lord your God. I suppose the modern equivalent would be, don't combine the whole field. Uh, leave a couple rows around the outside uh, for the poor and the immigrant. I don't know how practical that would be today. You know, the poor are in you know, Des Moines and Waterloo and Chicago and other places. And besides, they don't have the equipment to harvest. They don't have the market to, to get rid of it. I don't really think that's really very practical. But the idea of leaving something of our abundance for the poor does make sense. I had occasion to live that out a number of years ago. Um, my mother